State Secretary Oli Kosky that uh, policy should be very careful in uh, in um, tackling with the population dynamics directly. Uh, these are mainly choices made by um, sovereign citizen. Um, so um, uh, population policy should have uh, not the deal to change the population, <laughs> uh, but rather uh, maximize their well-being. And that is why uh, in my talk, I will uh, concentrate on uh, the measure of well-being that uh, Wolfgang Lutz has proposed. And I think it's a pretty good idea uh, to put the years of good life in the, uh, in the center of attention. So I want to do three issues. Um, the first one is uh, um, point out that if you want to create uh, years of good life uh, uh, and use science uh, to, to be informed on which policies are actually good and which are not so good, you really have to base your policies on causality chains. What I mean, uh, you will see in a moment, uh, it will be much easier than the uh, uh, wicked uh, uh, picture Elena has just shown us. Um, the second one is uh, uh, if you want to improve um, uh, years of good life, uh, you, you probably cannot just throw money on it. Um, and and, and parts of that is uh, it will be way too expensive. Uh, but the other uh, part is uh, the population's uh, modern societies are very heterogeneous uh, and you have to identify hotspots. Uh, uh, and there is uh, where you should spot, uh, put your money in. Um, and I would show that this goes best with suitable data um, and uh, uh, point out that particular um, data like share um, are very valuable in that respect. Um, and the final point is uh, uh, to give a, a very plastic kind of, um, of example, uh, how to maintain years of good life, even in a very large crisis. Um, and I will not talk much about the financial crisis, uh, but obviously, because this is all in our minds uh, about COVID-19 uh, right now. Okay, this is the uh, the outline. Uh, the key question, what are we really after? Um, and I want to stress that uh, uh, this is where, where uh, our aims and goals as political science citizens uh, overlap with those of, uh, of us as researchers. Um, we want to measure uh, the object which we want to improve um, and then uh, understand with the chain of causality. If I take this uh, picture of uh, Wolfgang, the easiest is to, 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 to really ask people how, how satisfied are they with life? Um, and uh, that is a very subjective measure. Um, that is sort of my first uh, level of causality. The second one is go a little bit deeper and actually look at more objective data. And Wolfgang has pointed out poverty uh, and then health, the absence of uh, severe cognitive and physical limitation. Uh, that can be measured quite objectively uh, and it's less controversial than uh, uh, the uh, soft kind of uh, measure of life satisfaction. But what we are really after is the third level of uh, actually the highest level of causality, which is what can we do in terms of policy? Um, and in terms of poverty, it's obviously economic policy, which is important. Uh, and in terms of uh, um, health, um, it is public health. Look, I'm not saying medical profession, I'm saying public health, uh, because health is created uh, in a much more complicated way than uh, uh, um, just at the doctor's office. Um, I will use a, a few examples to go uh, uh, through this chain of causality, obviously uh, with a focus on Finland, uh, because this uh, interests you most. Uh, let me again stretch uh, that this is a, uh, I try to have a very transparent approach uh, to a wicked problem. I do agree with Elena that it, this is a wicked problem, but I want to make it really transparent. So let, let me go to the first uh, level of causality, the lowest one, level three, I call it. Over, uh, this is overall life satisfaction in the EU. And if you have very good eyes, you actually see where Finland is. And congratulations, uh, it's way above uh, European average, uh, very good, uh, second in line, much after all these countries. Uh, only Ireland is, uh, is doing better than Finland. And if you allow me to make a little joke, uh, this is probably due to what they drink uh, uh, most. Um, overall life satisfaction is, uh, as I said, a very, very uh, 
soft measure, a little bit harder is uh, how you satisfied are with your job. Uh, this uh, um, picture shows job dissatisfaction. And again, Finland is doing really well uh, together with Austria, by the way. Uh, where Elena and, uh, and Wolfgang come from. Uh, and you see that the level of job dissatisfaction is very low, uh, 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 much lower than in Germany and Sweden, uh, not to speak about uh, France and uh, Greece at the very right hand um, side. Um, if we go one um, level uh, up and look uh, what is objectively behind this life satisfaction, uh, again, it's good news for Finland. Finland has uh, very low poverty. Um, and not only that it's very low, both for the older generation, this is above the diagonal, and the, uh, <clears throat> and the younger generation below, uh, it also has a good balance between uh, the generation. Uh, and you see that many countries are completely out of balance. Uh, Italy and France uh, favor the uh, older generation, whereas Germany and uh, Sweden tend to favor the, um, uh, the younger ones. Um, again, Finland gets uh, high marks on that. It's a little bit different on health. Um, this is a, a healthy life expectancy measured at age 65. Um, and again, let's, let's look at Finland first. Um, after age 65, on average, Finnish people have eight more years uh, without um, uh, limitations in their activities of daily, uh, daily living. Um, but it's uh, substantially lower than in uh, Sweden and in Denmark, for example. It's also lower than in the EU average. Um, so this gives you something to think. If you look a little closer, um, it's particularly the younger people. Uh, who have less functional health, uh, whereas it converges uh, to the EU average uh, at uh, ages of 70 and over. Uh, again, this already points you that uh, if uh, one wants to create years of good life, uh, one has to look at which uh, age uh, you are actually um, spending money on. Uh, and it seems to be more on the younger people in Finland uh, than on the older, which is different from many other countries uh, in the European Union. Okay, if I go to policy, then uh, 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 <clears throat> and, and let me take up uh, what I know best, which is pensions. Um, then you see that uh, pensions are not necessarily um, determined by the dependency ratio. Uh, as much as demography is important for pensions, uh, it explains only about half, uh, as you see. Uh, on the R squared of uh, what is going on in pensions. Uh, the rest is uh, pension policy design, and it can be more generous to the old or uh, more efficient, favoring the young. And again, looking at countries helps you uh, to, to, to look where you are. Um, this is actually uh, based on share data. Uh, and you see that there, there, there are countries who, um, who favor more the old, are generous to the old. And Finland is, um, is fairly close to the middle, uh, to the regression line here. Um, um, and uh, spending a little bit less on pensions than uh, uh, typical for, for the given dependency ratio. Um, so I think, again, Finland is doing fine uh, in, uh, in terms of pension policy and pension design. If you look at healthcare, um, Finland is, uh, is different. Um, and again, this is the, uh, the average of the European Union, uh, and Finland is substantially below uh, for a, um, a high income uh, country in, in the European Union. It spends much less of uh, their, uh, their GDP on, um, on healthcare than France, Germany, Sweden, and Austria, um, even if it's more than, uh, say, Italy or Spain, uh, which is to the right of Finland, as you can see. So going through this uh, uh, causality chain, uh, uh, I think gives you some idea where, where, where policy has to be active. Uh, if policy wants to um, uh, improve uh, years of good life. Let me, uh, in the second part, uh, quickly um, um, dig a little bit deeper how to improve years of good life. And as I already said, uh, in the focus of, uh, of my thinking, um, is not the aggregate. Uh, it's de definitely to get away from the aggregate view and uh, look at the heterogeneity of populations for the two reasons I already mentioned. 
First, we just cannot afford it. Good policy needs efficient targeting. It just cannot use uh, what we call in Germany the uh, uh, the watering pot uh, policy, uh, throwing uh, money on the general population. We need efficient targeting, and that needs data, uh, and particularly it needs micro data. The other reason is uh, uh, modern societies are just so heterogeneous. Uh, even if some parts uh, do well, uh, other parts may do very badly. Um, and let me quote a country uh, out of the uh, European Union, namely the, the United States, uh, where heterogeneity lets uh, some groups of the population live longer, as all of Europe does, uh, but other parts of, uh, of the United States actually have a shorter life expectancy than uh, we had earlier. These are uh, examples where, uh, where you see how uh, deep the problem um, actually may be to identify good uh, target groups. Uh, the first one is health. Uh, if you see health in Europe, then uh, uh, of course, it, uh, by age, uh, it goes slowly, very, very slowly down between uh, age 60 and 70. And that is what I'm most interested in in my own research, because that is the time when most people get into retirement. But you see, it's very, very slow. Uh, uh, this is self-rated health. Uh, if you look at functional health, uh, like I did earlier, uh, it's a very similar kind of, um, uh, uh, there is a decreasing trend, but it's very, very slow. You can also measure health very objective. You see at the, the picture at the right hand, this is grip strength, uh, where you use your, your the, the power with your hands and you measure in kilo. Also, this goes down. But there's another phenomenon. And I, what, what I show in these orange bars is the variation in each group of, um, of uh, by age, 60, 61, and so forth, to 69. And you see that the uh, uh, healthiest person at age 69 is much healthier than the unhealthiest person at age 60, 10 years younger. It is not age per se which determines health and where you should put your money if you want to put, uh, improve health in Finland or in Europe. But it's really the heterogeneity of health where you have to take care of. And you have to spend money on the, uh, on the unhealthy ones, uh, almost independent of how old they are. That's a very, very different point of view uh, than what is often said in uh, public health. Let me dig again a little bit more deeper here uh, and look at uh, heterogeneity here by education. So th this is not an easy graph to read. Uh, it actually looks at the difference in certain kinds of, uh, of illnesses by wealth groups. And uh, this shows the difference. Um, now, let me just make an example. If you look at women, which is the red bar, uh, then you see that uh, the, the number here is about 1.6. This means there is 6% higher probability uh, uh, among women, uh, less educated men, women uh, to have a stroke or to suffer from diabetes uh, than for the better educated women. So stroke and diabetes are much more prevalent among less educated women. If you look at men, then uh, lung illnesses uh, stick out. Uh, 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 less educated men are 90% more prevalent uh, to actually get uh, lung illnesses. Uh, and the biggest one uh, here is lung cancer. Um, and if you dig that deep, then you see immediately where the problems are in public health. Uh, um, uh, health behaviors uh, strongly uh, affect diabetes, but also stroke. Uh, and smoking behavior obviously very strongly uh, determines lung illnesses. Um, so you need to dig deep into data which measure health, education, uh, other socioeconomic status to really understand where you have to put your money to create uh, years of good life. Um, my last slide um, is uh, maybe a worrying slide. Um, this is uh, the percentage of self-reported in uh, good health. This is the percentage uh, with uh, at least one activity limitation. So good health is in that direction up. Good health is in that direction down uh, to the right of this one. And I do this now by cohort. And what we all have learned and believe is that from cohort to cohort, things get better. This also was very much underlying uh, the spirit of uh, Wolfgang's uh, lecture. It will get better in the future.
I'm not so sure. This is the uh, health uh, uh, of uh, the generation born in uh, 40 to 44. It has substantially improved for the next generation and keeps improving for uh, the uh, early baby boomers. Even after the early baby boomers, uh, the percentage self-reporting in good health is up, but then it changes and it goes down. Now, if you take a little bit more uh, a objective measure uh, to the right-hand side of that picture, uh, the same story again. Um, you start with the, uh, with the early borns, uh, then it gets better for the next generation and still better for, by the way, mine generation. But then it turns around uh, and it substantially turns back uh, for the uh, generation, which is about 10 years younger than uh, I am myself. Uh, we don't know really the reasons. We do have some indications, particularly in the US, but also in the uh, um, central, um, in, the, um, uh, in the big uh, uh, EU countries like Germany and France. We do see a higher um, prevalence of diabetes in these uh, health behavior related illnesses. Well, we can definitely not conclude from the past uh, that uh, the future will be healthier. By the way, and sadly, we see a similar thing in education. Um, education is stagnating in quite a few countries. It's going down in the U.S. Uh, also, labor force participation is actually going down in the U.S. and not up anymore. Uh, so uh, we definitely need to, 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 to as scientists, uh, to, to put a lot of effort to really understand uh, why there is a reversal of all these positive trends uh, in the making. Um, and I think this requires uh, uh, detailed microdata uh, because it holds for special population groups only and not for the entire population. Let me finish with a, with a uh, uh, really out of the fresh press uh, example of uh, what a uh, microdata set can actually deliver in terms of uh, maintaining years of good life um, in, uh, in a large crisis. Uh, 10 years ago, we had the financial crisis uh, and we learned a lot from the share data. Uh, right now, uh, it's COVID, uh, which keeps us busy, a, a data set uh, which has uh, socioeconomics uh, as well as health like share is extremely uh, helpful to, to, uh, to understand who is doing well um, and uh, which country is not doing so well. Let me uh, do the, the similar kind of uh, three-level causality as I did before. Um, uh, as a measure of well-being and life satisfaction, we actually have loneliness uh, in a survey which we did uh, in the uh, peak of the lockdown. Uh, um, in early summer of, uh, of this very year. And what you see, let, let's jump to Finland right here. Here's a, a measure of uh, loneliness. Uh, and there, there are two things which uh, catch your eye. First, Finland is doing really well. Um, the perception of loneliness is very low. But even more astounding, uh, if you look, it has become better during the lockdown uh, than it was before. That is a striking finding. This is actually echoed. Uh, in, uh, in other countries, uh, like in Italy and France, it has stayed constant and it, it, it did not get worse. Um, that, that is a, really a, uh, uh, an interesting finding. We have to think about it. It's not a universal finding. If I look at Germany and, uh, and Sweden, then loneliness actually went up. So looking at the causes for this, I think it's a, it's a, a subject which uh, we should follow up um, in our research right now. If we go down uh, the causality chain one, 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 one further and look at uh, a measure of uh, not poverty, but how we are doing, we looked at average income loss. And there it looks differently. Here uh, uh, you see the, uh, the, the average income loss during the lockdown in the, um, uh, in the European Union was almost a third, but it was worse in Finland, quite a bit worse actually. Uh, not as bad as Italy, uh, but certainly worse than uh, Denmark, uh, France, Germany, and, uh, and Sweden. So I don't know the, uh, the cause, uh, but I would encourage uh, uh, Swedish researchers to really look and share COVID data uh, and try to find out why. Um, my final slide is uh, again going uh, one step up the, uh, the, the, the levels of causality. Uh, and really ask, uh, what, what do we really know about uh, the, the lockdown period? Um, and uh, the, the, the two slides here um, uh, show uh, 
put the average income loss, uh, which was high, this 40% almost in Finland, by the COVID caseload. Uh, and what you see, particularly if you compare to, uh, to, uh, to Sweden, Sweden had a much, much higher caseload uh, in terms of COVID, but did much better in terms of um, uh, lost income. But there are also countries uh, who have a similar caseload um, as Finland and still do better. Is this a factor of the lockdown stringency because we want to distinguish between what the what the virus did and what policy did and this is sort of by the virus this is by the policy and again you see uh, the, if, if, if this is the general policy you, you do see a connection that the income uh, loss gets worse um, with the stringency of the lockdown. Uh, but there are countries uh, who did much better, even Sweden, doing nothing, but also Germany and France, uh, getting a, uh, given the same kind of stringency and saving when many, many more people than Sweden did, um, but still doing better in terms of economic policy. So this is something to think about, uh, uh, particularly as the second wave is now ongoing. We want years of good life even in a crisis like uh, the COVID crisis. Um, and uh, these data uh, collected by SHARE uh, tell you where, uh, where policy has to put uh, their eye on. Let me finish and conclude. Years uh, of good life are created in a, a chain of causality uh, that involves interacting health, social and economic policies. Understanding the interaction is, uh, is, is really important. The chain of causality, I think, is fairly simple uh, and transparent, uh, even though it's a wicked problem. Not only that the virus is wicked, the problem behind us as well. Um, efficient policies need targeting due to the large heterogeneity, but you have to target uh, along many dimensions by age, by cohort, by socioeconomic status. That requires microdata, which, uh, where you can distinguish the different uh, population groups. Uh, and of course, I want to advertise share for that uh, because it's a country which combines so many uh, dimensions in one single uh, data set, unlike registered data where you have uh, only income or only health. Uh, share really shows the, the, the entire picture of where we are. Now, such a micro database needs to be in place when a crisis comes. Well, I want to remember you that both the financial crisis, uh, but also uh, COVID came as surprises. Uh, we are a very advanced society. Nevertheless, these crises come sudden. If politics want help by scientists, then they need uh, uh, observatories. Uh, let me call these data observatories, which are in place. Uh, they cannot be created. Once a crisis comes, they have to be there. Uh, and then we can uh, help uh, in terms of policy. Thank you very much. <clears throat>